Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the last lecture in the Armenian Studies Program series for the fall of 2012. We are very lucky um, to have Tamar Boyajan uh, concluding this series of 2012. But before I introduce Tamar, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, MEMS, the Medieval and Early Modern Studies Program, and Mediotopos, who were very grateful for um, helping us out in this visit to invite Tamar from California. Tamar was trained from the start to the very end by the UCLA system. She received her BA from UCLA in 2002 with a degree in English literature and a minor in Near Eastern languages and cultures, an MA from the same Near Eastern languages and cultures in 2002, and a PhD from the Department of Comparative Literature in 2010. Her dissertation, bringing, Bridging East and West, a study of Jerusalem in the literature and chronicles of the early Crusades, receive a su summa cum laude. In her dissertation, she focuses on the literary representations of the medieval city of Jerusalem, using an impressive array of languages, Arabic, Armenian, Latin, Old French, and Middle English. Curious about how the East encounters the West in these literary and historical texts, her research questions our current understanding of the East and the West as monolithic entities. She is now turning her dissertation into a monograph entitled The City Lament, Jerusalem and Medieval Literature, where she weaves together a number of laments over the loss of Jerusalem in the Middle English, Old French, Middle Armenian, and Arabic traditions. From the lament of Richard the Lionhearted as he departs from Jerusalem to the Abbasid poet Ibn Abi Werdi's writing of the fall of Jerusalem to the Franks and the lament of the Armenian patriarch Grigor Tlay composed after the fall of Jerusalem to Saloedin, she listens to these melancholic voices to hear how they construct themselves and others. Beyond this multivalent study of the crusade, uh, Tamar Boyajan is skilled in the art of paleography and codicology. She is currently working in the special collections at the UCLA uh, library as a postdoctoral fellow, where she has discovered quite a few hidden treasures from what she's just told me. Also, the Minas Young collection of family from um, Esfahan in Julfa, where she's found not only 14th century Armenian manuscripts, um, an illustration of the mystical sword of the last Armenian king of Silesia, Levon V, as well as a number of really interesting Hebraic scrolls um, that show this inter interconnectedness between Jewish, Armenian, and Muslim um, denizens of Esfahan at the time. Um, Tamar will also be speaking tomorrow uh, at noon at our multidisciplinary graduate run workshop uh, run by our very own students, Michael Pfeiffer and Alison Vaca. It's going to be the first time that they're inaugurating this workshop. So Tamar will be speaking there um, about around conversations on Armenian studies. It will be in room 3627 at the International Institute, this very building, tomorrow, and there will be lunch. Um, before we start uh, by welcoming Tamar, I also wanted to tell you that as you leave the room, we have both our new newsletter available and a list of lectures and workshops that we're going to be having in the winter term of 2013. So please join me now to welcome Tamar. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank the Armenian Studies Program here at University of Michigan, as well as the co-sponsors of the event, Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, the International Institute, Medieval and Early Modern Studies, and a special thanks to Catherine Babayan and Natasha. I'm very pleased to be invited to speak to all of you here today. And my talk entitled Rereading the Crusades, Armenian Sources, is composed of three sections. 
The first, I will begin by discussing the way in which European scholarship has constructed the study of the Crusades and the position that scholars in general have held toward Eastern and Armenian sources, and more specifically Armenian sources. The second part will then move to a brief survey on what the Armenian sources are for the Crusading period and how these sources can aid in reconstructing the field of medieval studies. And in the conclusion of my talk, I will apply my analysis and suggestions of how to reread the Crusades in, onto one of these Armenian sources, the Lament of Katolikos Krikor Dra, um, which I will close read within the greater context of the medieval Mediterranean. And I'm gonna kind of include uh, some information on a digital humanities project that hopes to kind of achieve a similar framework within which I'll, I'll be talking about today. Most beloved brethren, urged by necessity, I, Urban, by the permission of God, have come into these parts as an ambassador with a divine admonition to you. For your brethren who live in the East are in urgent need of your help, and you must hasten to give them the aid, which has often been promised them. O race of the Franks, O people loved and chosen by God, sad news has come from Jerusalem that the Turks and Arabs, an accursed and foreign race, enemies of God, have invaded the lands of the Christians and devastated them. Set out on this journey, for God wills it, and you will obtain the remission of your sins and be sure of the incorruptible glory of the kingdom of heaven. A version of this report of Pope Urban's speeches at the Council of Clermont in November of 1095, believed by some scholars to be the instigating force behind the crusading movement in Western Europe, appears as the opening lines of almost all scholarly publications devoted to the study of the Crusades. The term crusade from the French croissade, or literally the one bearing the cross, has come to represent an understanding of religiously motivated campaigns of Western Europeans conducted roughly between the late 11th to the 14th, or some scholars argue 15th or 16th century, in territories in and outside the Levant, usually against pagans, heretics, and like groups, and argued by scholars to be motivated by religious, political, and economic reasons. The notion of crusade, as realized in Pope Urban II's call at Claremont, has been translated as an embodiment of Western European and Christian heroism, a political and cultural war on jihad and terrorism, and a battle against Islam. The application of the term crusade or crusading history and literature, I argue, represents a limited scope in that it confines our understanding to the perspective of Western Europe and the views of the European Christian Occident towards and in conflict with an Islamic Orient. A majority of scholarship surrounding the study of the Crusades reflects this type of antagonistic and fragmented approach to the period. Crusading histories and publications have for, for the most part relied on literary and historiographic productions of Western European authors, failing to consider texts from, quote, the East as significant resources to the study of the period. Orientalists have oftentimes dismissed or glanced over the works produced in Armenian, Arabic, Greek, Hebrew, and other traditions in their original languages, claiming that these sources are either non-existent for the period or lacking in content. According to the study of British social anthropologist Sir Jack Goody in his The Theft of History, I quote, Europe has not simply neglected or underplayed the history of the rest of the world, as a consequence of which it has misinterpreted its own history, but it has also imposed historical concepts and periods that have aggravated our understanding of Asia in a way that is significant for the future as well as for the past. The last century and a half has seen a plethora of material relating to the study of the crusading battles, which includes and is not limited to printing of primary sources in the form of single text editions, compilations and anthologies, secondary literature such as history books, films and documentaries, and many others. What role, if any, have Armenian sources played in crusading scholarship? And in what ways have the literary and historiographic texts of the Armenians been viewed and reflected upon in the studies of the period? For the most part, Armenian sources have seen little consideration in crusading scholarship. Apart from the work of a handful of scholars, the presence and contributions of the Armenians are oftentimes ignored. 
Volumes devoted to the study of the Crusades, as well as compilations and readers, such as Thomas Madden's Crusades Essential Readings and Tierman's Chronicles of the First Crusade, are a few examples of how Eastern sources for the period, particularly those of the Armenians, have been overlooked. This exclusion of Armenian sources can partly be due to the fact that many of these Armenian texts, which I will name later in my talk, have not been translated or have only been partially translated into modern European languages. The difficulty to access some of these sources could also be a contributing factor to their absence in scholarship. However, there also seems to be a general opinion by European scholars that Armenian sources are either lacking in content or include erroneous and inaccurate information. Arguably considered one of the greatest crusader scholars, Sir Stephen Runciman makes the following observation about Armenian sources of the period in his legendary three volume, A History of the Crusades. There is one invaluable Armenian source covering the period of the first crusade, the Chronicle of Matthew of Edessa. Matthew was a naive man with hatred for the Greeks and no great love for those of his compatriots who were orthodox in religion. Much of his information about the Crusades must have been derived from some ignorant Frankish soldier. Though Runciman should be credited for his consideration of Armenian sources, his position towards Matthew's text and Armenian material in general should also be reflected upon. Runciman castigates Matthew's chronicle because it does not complement the information found in European sources and attributes Matthew's contribution to the misinformation of, quote, some ignorant Frankish soldier. It is noteworthy that Runciman admits to not having consulted any of the manuscripts of Matthew's text, but relied on extracts from the chronicle translated to French by Dularier in the multi-volume Recuel des Historiens des Croissades, more commonly referred to as the RHC. Runciman's judgment extends to Armenian literary sources of the period as well. He writes that the lament on Edessa or Vohbietesio, composed by the Catholicos or Armenian High Patriarchy, Patriarch Nessa Shunorhali, and argued by scholars to be one of the greatest literary creations in the Armenian language, is, quote, somewhat lacking in both poetical and historical interest. Runciman's trivializing opinion of crusading sources in Armenian is also shared by Carl F. Newman, the translator of the Chronicle of Rah Vahram Rabuni, printed for the Oriental Translation Fund in 1831. Newman begins the preface of his translation of Rabuni's Chronicle, which he refers to as, quote, monotonous historical rhymes by claiming, I quote, the greatest defect of the following chronicle is its brevity. He, assumingly Vahram, relates many barren facts without stating the circumstances with which they were connected, and he mistakes everywhere the passions of men for the finger of God. The compilers of chroniclers were in those days ignorant of the true end and unacquainted with the proper objects of history. But with all its defects, the chronicle of the Armenian kings of Cilicia is valuable. Alongside such opinions that Armenian accounts are lacking in style and content is also the attempt to consider Armenian sources as a way of informing European perspectives on the events of the period. Editions of historiographic and literary works of the Crusades, such as the well-recognized RHC series, reflect attempts to incorporate and reframe Eastern sources within a European discourse. The RHC contains two volumes dedicated to the Armenian sources of the crusading period entitled Document Armenian. The first volume, published in 1896, is comprised of excerpts from the medieval Armenian literary and historiographic tradition. A closer look at the selected passages in this volume reveals how the compilation seems to expand more upon our knowledge of the crusading efforts from Western Europe since the sections which are included from Armenian texts focus on the presence and history of the European crusaders in Armenian Cilicia. For example, the excerpt of 10 pages from the extensive work of Vartan Areveltsi, or Vartan of the East, known as the Havakum and Batmuchun, or historical compilation, begins in medias res with a statement which likens the Armenian prince Gosh Vasil to the Franks. The selected passage then continues with information regarding Baldwin IV, also known as the Leper King of Jerusalem, and names the treaty with Saladin signed during his reign by his cousin and acting regent Raymond III of Tripoli. 
Saladin's later attack on Jerusalem is also included, along with the appearance of the English king Richard Coeur de Lyon, or the Lionhearted. The excerpt ends with the death of King Leo I, the first Armenian king of Cilicia in 1219, and the naming of his daughter Isabel, wife of Philip of Antioch, as regent ruler. Similarly, the brief section from the Chronicle of Samuel Anetsi, or Samuel of Ani, provided in volume one, also focuses on happenings and persons connected to Western European presence in the Levant. The provided passage begins with the account of the Frankish victory over Jerusalem in 1099, and then includes details pertaining to the Crusaders, such as the crowning of Baldwin of Edessa, or Baldwin of Boulogne, as the first king of Crusader Jerusalem, and the interaction between the Franks and Salah ad -Din. As seen in these two examples, the sections from Armenian sources in volume one of RHC's document Armenian seem to function as addendums which supplement and enhance the information offered by European sources. These portions are not contextualized within the larger framework of Armenian and Cilician history and the interactions with other ethno-religious groups in the medieval period, but positioned within the framework of European history. The excerpts from Matthew of Edessa's Chronicle, for instance, in this volume, are arranged under rubrics like Expeditions of the Crusaders to Syria and Palestine and the First Crusade, etc. In his preface to document Armenian, Doularguer expresses an opinion which supports this type of arrangement when, and here I paraphrase from the French, he claims that the significance of studying and considering the texts of the Armenians in crusading history is their contact and interaction with the Latin West. Armenian Cilicia is important because the Crusaders were present there. This viewpoint is further reflected in the selection of chronicles which comprises volume two of document Armenian. There are no texts in the Armenian language in this volume. The volume is comprised of four Latin chronicles and two in French, which are all roughly dated to the 14th century. These include the Chronicle of Armenia by Jean Dardel, a Franciscan monk who became an advisor and confessor to the Cilician Armenian king Levon, or Leo V, who was imprisoned by the Emir of Aleppo and sent to Cairo in 1375. According to his history, Dardel met Leo in Cairo and accepted his invitation to act as his advisor and secretary. Other chronicles in the series include Hetum or Heton of Coricos's La Flore des Histoires de la Terre d'Orient, uh, the Flower of the History of the Orient, a history dictated in French and later translated to Latin for the purpose of convincing Pope Clement V for a new crusade in alliance with the Mongols, pseudo Bacardus's initiative for making the passage, a history addressed to King Philip VI of France and aimed at reviving the crusading energies of Western Europe against the Byzantine Empire and the Eastern Church, Guillaume Adam or William Adams regarding the extirpation of Saracens, Daniel of Thericio's response to the errors imposed by the Armenians, which reprimands Armenian doctrinal differences between the Church of Rome, and the old French, the deed of the Cypriots, attributed to the Templar of Tyre, which provides a detailed account of Christian activities in the Holy Land in the 13th century and their disagreement with, disagreements with the Egyptian Mamluks. Whereas the literary and historiographic texts in Armenian included in volume one were only excerpts, the chronicles in volume two are included in their entirety. Also, except for the figure of Heton of Korikos, an Armenian constable who converted to Roman Catholicism in 1305, all the other authors included in volume two are of European origin. Among the selections are testimonies to the failures of the East and attempts to propagate a new crusade in Western Europe against groups such as the Eastern Christians. The second volume, therefore, seems not to entirely reflect document Armenian, as its title suggests, but European perspectives on the Armenians or the interaction of the Armenians and other Eastern cultures with the Franks from the perspective of European authors. Bearing in mind, perhaps, the challenges of accessibility and lack of translation of Armenian sources, the general position held by crusading scholars toward Armenian material of the period can be summarized as follows. Armenian sources have either been overlooked or not considered in crusading histories. When Armenian texts are considered, they have been dismissed for being <coughs> inaccurate and lacking in style and content. And additions and translations which have used these sources have done so in order to inf inform a European perspective by focusing on those portions which contribute to European history and the crusading movement from Western Europe. 
This position is also one that is taken in regards to other Eastern tradition, traditions, such as the works of Arabic and Islamic authors. Though I will not be going into an extensive discussion of attitudes towards Arabic sources, I would like to point to one example, a compilation of histories translated from Arabic to Italian by Francisco Gabrielli, and then from Italian to English by E.J. Costella, entitled Arab Historians of the Crusades. This compilation, which for many years has functioned for scholars as a primary source, is not only problematic in that its multiple levels of translation move the reader farther away from the original source material, but also in its objective and selection of excerpts. The claim that the book's purpose is to, quote, help the European reader see the period of the Crusades from the other side reveals its approach to both Arabic culture and literature as one which is set in opposition to the European perspective. This framework is further reinforced in the organization of the book, which is divided into sections that all focus on events pertaining to the European crusaders told from the point of view of Arabic sources. Sec sections from various Arab sources, such as the history of Ibn al-Athir, Baha'uddin, Abu Shama, and others, are taken and placed under such rubrics as the Franks seize Antioch, the Franks conquer Jerusalem, the death of Godfrey, and the Frankish conquest that followed it, etc. As in the case with the document Armenian section in the RHC, Gabrielli's compilation seems to expand more upon our knowledge of the European Crusaders by attempting to supplement and reinforce Western perspectives of the Crusades, rather than providing an examination of the Arabic material within its own respective cultural milieu and within the greater context of the history and culture of the medieval period. Current trends in scholarship have attempted to move away from these types of anachronistic readings of the Crusades. One such example is the groundbreaking work of Carol Hillenbrand entitled The Crusades, Islamic Perspectives, which enriches the study of the period by offering the researcher accounts from Arab and Islamic sources contextualized within the broader ideological and sociocultural issues raised by the Crusader occupation of the Levant and other regions of the Mediterranean. As I have attempted to demonstrate, the partial, hierarchical, and preferential approaches to the study of the Crusades have contributed to the understanding of this period as solely antagonistic, West versus East, Christian versus Muslim, or Eastern Christian, European versus non-European. As such, the Crusades are presented by a large number of scholars as battles purely between Islam and Christianity, terms which are oftentimes reflective of the current political climate and used as symbols for national identities. This type of compartmentalized and disparate aligning is one which views cultures and their textual narratives in continual conflict, rather than exploring the contact and interactions between various ethno-religious groups as collaborative and interdependent. As a result, texts from this period have continuously been read against one another, rather than alongside each other. Rather than following the trajectory of past scholarship, which has framed the study of the Crusades within individually defined hegemonic and national discourses, which have for the most part been imposed and projected upon the Middle Ages, I would like to challenge these types of entrenched approaches to the study of this period by suggesting an alternate overarching framework, the medieval Mediterranean, as proposed by Horton and Purcell in their watershed study, The Corrupting Sea. I therefore propose a reading of these sources as not ones that necessarily contribute to a, quote, crusading narrative, a position which presumes a Western European perspective and ultimately drives a wedge between Europe and the East, but a medieval Mediterranean one. In their monumental study, A Corrupting Sea, a study of Mediterranean history, Horton and Purcell paradoxically locate the unity of the Mediterranean in its geographic, social, and economic fragmentation. Their study demonstrates how the diversity and heterogeneity of the Mediterranean, composed of distinct and fragmented polities that affiliated themselves with specific religious orientations, contributes to its profound unity, where various ethno-religious cultures are connected through a shared ecology and history. This zone of commerce, exchange, and cultural transmission was, as they argue, composed of diverse cultures that through their proximity were integrated politically, culturally, and institutionally. Therefore, in my attempt to reread the Crusades, I suggest considering sources for the period, both East and West, in context of their own cultural and literary milieu, 
as well as ones that contribute to a larger understanding of the history and literature of the medieval Mediterranean. By doing so, I argue that the Mediterranean serves as a framework within which the process of exchange and acculturation between various ethno-religious groups in the medieval period, manifested within both antagonistic and collaborative contexts, could be better understood. This is a point I will return to at the end of my talk. The rising control of Byzantium in the 11th century and their eventual seizure of the city of Ani in 1045 ended the last major Armenian kingdom in Greater Armenia, the Bagratid dynasty, and resulted in disintegration of Armenian rule over historical Armenian territory. As testified by many contemporary sources, including the highly esteemed Batmunchun or history of the 11th century Armenian figure Aristakes Lastiverti, in 1064, the expanding Seljuk powers captured the city of Ani from Byzantium, and on August 26, 1071, on the plains of Manzikert, the Seljuk army, with the leadership of Arp Aslan, defeated the Byzantine army, ultimately weakening their authority of Anatolia and Armenia. A majority of scholars trace the beginning of the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia to this pivotal battle of Manaskert, after which a number of Armenian lords and princes led their people across the Taurus Mountains and settled north of the Mediterranean in the region of Cilicia, where there had been an Armenian presence for many centuries. Here they eventually established their own independent kingdom, ruled by two rival dynasties, the Rupanids and Hetumids, which lasted for almost 300 years from 1080 to 1375. This period in Armenian history, also known as the Silver Age, is praised for its great production of historical and literary works and a large number of translations, as well as characterized as an era with a revival of learning and its contact with the West. I would like to therefore provide a really brief survey of some of the notable sources in Armenian from this period, which contribute to the study of the Crusades and the presence of the Europeans in Cilicia and the Levant. These texts are at the same time valuable resources for the study of Byzantium, the Caucasus, Syria, the Levant, as well as studying other ethno-religious groups such as the Mongols, Persians, Seljuks, Caucasian Albanians, Mamluks, and others. In providing this concise list of primary material in Armenian, I hope to both reveal that the claim of a lack of Armenian sources for the period is an indeed a misconception, and also preface my catalog by claiming that the approach to these Armenian texts, and here I'm using the terminology of the Islamic scholar Fred Donner, um, should move beyond the skeptical and descriptive approach to one that is source critical and analytical. A highly informative and important source for the study of the early Crusades is the Jamanaga Kruchun, or Chronicle of Mateos Urhayetsi, or Matthew of Edessa, a 12th century Armenian history composed in three parts and surviving in 43 manuscripts that spans the years 952 to about 1129, and later continued by Krikor Yeretz, or Gregory the Elder, to the year 1162. Other significant historiographic works of the period also include a 13th century work of Vartan Areveltsi that I noted earlier, Vartan from the East, also known as Vartan Meds or the Great, entitled Havakuman Batmuchun or Historical Compilation. Among his rich account is also a testimony of his pilgrimage to the holy sites in Jerusalem in 1240 and his visit to the court of the Armenian king Hetum I. The Chronicle of Vahram Rabuni, which provides a genealogical outline of the Armenian kings of Cilicia, starting with Rupen I, the founder of the Rupinian dynasty, which ruled Armenian Cilicia until 1219, up to the figure of King Levon III, who commissioned him to write the work. The 12th century history of Samuel Anetsi, or Samuel of Ani, continued by later writers to 1665, as well as the history of another figure from Ani, Mukhitar Anetsi. The 13th century chronological history of Mukhitar Airevanetsi, which summarizes the history of the Armenians up to the year 1289, and the history of the Armenian Cilicia by a 14th century Armenian figure, Nessas Palients, a member of the Benedictine order who visited Pope Clement V in Avignon and authored and translated many works while he was there. The chronological history of the Armenian king Hetum II, which covers the period from 1076 
1296 is also a vital and unique source, which interweaves the history of Armenian Cilicia with the European Crusaders and provides specific details about the Latin kings of Jerusalem. The account's reference to the figure of Peter, of Peter the Hermit is noteworthy and supports the claims of the 12th century Latin historian Albert of Aachen regarding Peter the Hermit's role in the preaching of the First Crusade. Another geolo ge genealogical catalog, that of an Armenian prince named Hubbuf, is a mysterious work, an edition and English translation of which appears in a volume produced by the Oriental Translation Fund in 1831. The Dadakirk or Chronicle of Sampat's Oops, excuse me. of Sampat the High Constable or Sampat Sparabed, the older brother of Armenian king, king of Cilicia, Hetum the First, covers the years from 951 to 1274, and continuations by anonymous author reached to about the 1330s. Among his testimonies of the period, Sampad's chronicle also includes information regarding his visit to the Mongol capital of Karakorum. Other significant historical, historiographic and literary works that cover the period of Mongol invasion and domination include the Batmuchunar history of Giragos of Ganzak, Stepanos Orbelian's Batmuchun Nahankin Sisagan, or the history of province of Sunik, Krikor of Agans or Agnerzi's History of the Nation of Archers, which are the Mongols, as well as the four-volume work of Constable Hetum of Korikos, which I named earlier. The English writer John Mandeville is believed to actually have taken his information on the history and geography of Asia from the chronicle of he Hetum of Korikos. Literary works of the period also include the poetry and fables of the Armenian poet Frigg, as well as those of Mahitar Ghosh and Khachadur Gecharetsi, including his lament on the Eastern lands. Correspondence between prominent Armenian figures and those of the West, for example, as seen in this letter here, composed by Sampad the High Constable to Henry I of Cyprus and John of Ibilin, is another supplier of the social and political history of the period. Armenian charters, eucumenical efforts, translations of texts from Latin, Greek, and other languages, including the efforts of the Unitors, religious treaties such as the Armad Havado or Root of the Faith of Vartan Aiketsi, and memoirs such as the one of the acclaimed Nerses Lampronazi or Nerses of Lampron, are also among the sources for the study of the Crusading period since they testify to both exchanges between the Armenians and the West as well as display the doctrinal conflicts between the two churches. One of the most celebrated literary works of the period is the Vogh Pietesio, or Lament on Edessa, composed by a member of the prominent Pahlavuni family and well known for his eucumenical efforts, Nerses Shinorali, or Nerses the Gracious, following the capture of Edessa in December of 1144 by Zengi, the Emir of Mosul, the event which propagated the Second Crusade. There is also one extremely noteworthy but overlooked and perhaps misunderstood piece of literature composed in this period, Catholicos Krikordra, or Krikord the Boy, um, poem, Asatsial Ban Vokberkagan Vasen Arman Yerusalemi, or the poem of lamentation over the capture of Jerusalem. Catholicos Krikordra's poetic work has customarily been read as part of the trajectory of the Armenian literary tradition of the Vokb, or lament, the roots of which date back to the biblical lamentations over Jerusalem sung by the prophet Jeremiah, and has frequently been contrasted to the highly celebrated works of two of Dra's predecessors, Krikor Naregatsi's Book of Lamentations, and even more so to the lament composed after the fall of Edessa by his uncle, Nerses Shinorali, which I just cited. In these comparisons, some Armenian scholars have oftentimes argued that Dra's lament is inferior in style and historical information to that of his uncle, Shinorali. I would like to conclude my talk today by offering another type of reading of this medieval Armenian literary work by rereading the source within the greater context of the medieval Mediterranean. I argue that this lament builds itself around a significant moment in Cilician history with its propagation of the Armenian prince and later first king of Cilicia, Levon, or Leo, as an ally of Rome and the future savior of Jerusalem. At the same time, this crusading source embodies features 
which exposed intercultural exchange and acculturation between East and West in the medieval period, both in its conceptualization of the city of Jerusalem and in its attempts to foreground the position of the Armenians in the Lament's contemporary social and political world. Two years after the capture of the city of Jerusalem in 1187 by the great Islamic leader Saladin ibn Yusuf Ayyub, better known as Saladin, the Armenian prince Levon and Catholic Kostra received a letter from Pope Clement III informing them of the organization of the Third Crusade, also known as the King's Crusade, under the leadership of Frederick Barbarossa, Philip II of France, and Richard I of England. The contents of the letter included a formal request from Dra and the rising Cilician Prince Levon for financial and military assistance to the crusading army. Levon and Dra are known to have drafted several letters in response, one of which included an appeal to Emperor Frederick Barbarossa and the Pope asking for a crown when Barbarossa arrived for the crusade. Both the Pope and Barbarossa responded in agreement to combining the Armenian lands in Cilicia into an independent kingdom. According to the poem's colophon, Krikor Dra composed his poem of lamentation in the same year that these numerous exchanges and negotiations were taking place, the year 668 of the Armenian calendar, or 1189. Krikor's poem of lamentation assumes a system of commonplaces already associated with the representation of fallen cities as they appear in the Hebrew Bible, and posits the loss of Jerusalem to Saladin into this model. Narrated from the point of view of the fallen city, Jerusalem describes her destruction and desecration and Saladin's eventual victory. Numerous references to the wrath of God and the fall of the city as a result of the sins of the Christian population are also recalled. The desire for independence from the lands of the enemy is interlaced with statements calling for political organization and military advancements. Jerusalem presents Levon as both the liberator of Armenian Cilicia and, more importantly, the figure that will save her from the hands of the enemy. In its attempts to present Levon as an emancipator, Krikor's lament establishes a connection between the city of Jerusalem and the Armenians. The poem includes numerous references to Mount Zion, most notably among a 300-line refrain midway through the text where Jerusalem occupies the second part of each line of verse. More importantly, Jerusalem equates herself with Mount Zion when she claims at numerous points, Lern Zion Yerusalem, or Mount Zion Jerusalem. This metonymic function of Mount Zion as the city of Jerusalem reflects the poem's desire to re-envision Jerusalem as a space which is also mindful of the Armenians. Armenian presence in Jerusalem dates back to early Christianity with a documented presence in the fifth century. According to the study of Adrian J. Bos, the Armenians were predominantly concentrated around the area of Mount Zion during the Crusader period and linked to the history of the Cathedral of St. James. According to the Armenian tradition, Mount Zion was also the location of the house of the high priest of the Jews, Cephas, and the location of Christ's arrest and delivery to crucifixion. Armenian claim to their quarter near, near Mount Zion comes from the belief that the small room in the upper level of the house of Cephas on the mountains was being used as a church in the early days of Christianity. Following the ascension, it is also an accepted tradition among Armenians that the apostles elected as the first bi bishop, James the Younger, who establishes his seat on Mount Zion, the location of the site of the Armenian Cathedral of St. James. The cathedral is also believed to be the site of the beheading and burial of James the Great, brother of John the Evangelist, by Herod in 44 AD. Arab historians from the period, such as Abu Shama and Baha ad-Din, record an edict from Saladin in 583 or 1187-88, stating that the Church of St. James, the House of Cephas, the Church of St. Helena, and the Chapel of St. John in the Holy Sepulchre are properties of the Armenians in the Holy City. This attempt to establish a connection between the city of Jerusalem and the Armenians is further evident through a textual representation of the map of the world at the onset of Krikor's Lament. Around 20 lines into the poem appears a geographic description of the world through the point of view of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem says, I am not unfamiliar to the four corners of the earth, which they call the tripartite world. I am neither a foreigner to Europe, nor am I distant from Africa. 
Asia is near the border and close to my region. What shall I say of the Pontus, or about the black, which is somewhat resembling? Or what of the ocean they name the Great Caspian, and what of the Sea of Egypt, which is close to Mount Sinai? That which they call the Red, the same, and the Sea Mediterranean. These references to both the land masses and bodies of water at the onset of the poem textually recreate a view of the world through the concept of the medieval rota terrarum, or orbis terrae. This construction is better known today as the Psalter map, or the TO map of the world. The schematic for the cartographic representation of the world through the TO structure, first introduced by Cosmos and later developed by Isidore of Seville, produced a map seen here, where the three land masses, Asia, Europe, and Africa, are in the form of a T, the edges of which are surrounded <coughs> excuse me, by an O, which corresponds to the bodies of water. Asia occupies the top of the map and is twice as large as Europe and Africa, which appear to the bottom left and right, respectively. Moreover, the upper part of the T represents the Mediterranean Sea, which separates the landmass of Africa from that of Europe. The Red Sea, which occupies the right side of the crossbar, separates Africa from Asia, whereas the left side of the crossbar, representing the Black Sea, the Don River, Tineus in its Greek form, and the Sea of Azov, separates Europe from Asia. A significant feature of the Teo map is that it also possesses an eastern orientation. The reasoning behind this placement comes from the direction of the rising sun. This eastern point of reference was further influenced by the belief that the long lost garden of Eden or the terrestrial paradise lie at the farther, farthest eastern point of the earth. In Christian attempts to organize and theologize space, Jerusalem occupies the center of the map. The symbol of the T may be a symbol both representing the cross and reflecting the city where Christ was crucified. The black, red, and Mediterranean are the three bodies of water characteristically featured in medieval TO maps, with some maps including variants such as the River Don and Azov. This lament also names the Caspian as one of the featured bodies of water. The three continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia, are also accompanied with what seems to be an uncharacteristic reference to the geographic region of the Pontus. Although the reference to these regions may seem atypical, the inclusion of the Pontus and the Caspian Sea within Jerusalem's mapping of the world is yet another attempt to link Jerusalem to the Armenians. The geographic region between the Pontus, the area south of the Black Sea, and the Caspian is the area of greater Armenia in its historical geographic setting, as evident in the 7th century Ashkara Tzuitz or geography attributed to the Armenian cartographer Anayanias of Shirak. The Pontus also connects the Armenians to the early days of Christianity and calls to mind their conversion under Kigdertat or Tiridatis. The various links between the Armenians and Jerusalem within Grigor's Lament are reflective of the poem's political motives of appeasing Rome and gaining an autonomous kingdom of Cilicia. In the Lament, Jerusalem reprimands other cities such as Antioch and other groups such as the Greeks for not coming to her aid and preventing her capture. It is only Rome who receives the adjective of banzali, or glorious. The failure of these groups makes the greatness of Prince Levon, who is compared to the fearless warriors of the Old Testament and other great leaders in history, more apparent. Levon becomes the symbolic figure through which the text can both anticipate the upcoming advancement of the new crusade and at the same time expose Levon as the champion of Jerusalem, an ally of Rome, and the leader who will help regain the city back from Saladin. Bearing in mind the social and political circumstances surrounding the composition of Grigor's Lament, as well as broadening the scope within which the Lament is read, enables us to better understand the history of the period and allows for this text to be read alongside other literary works of differing traditions. For example, Grigor Dra's Lament over the capture of Jerusalem can be read as part of the trajectory of not just the Armenian Lament tradition, but laments composed over the loss of cities such as Jerusalem in the medieval period. Other such works include the panegyric verses of the jurist and Abbasid court poet Ibn al Abawardi following the loss of Jerusalem to the Franks in 1099, as well as the section in the anonymous English chronicle, Itinerarium Regis Ricardi, or the Itinerary of Richard I, which includes the lament of Richard the Lionhearted upon his departure from Jerusalem. 
A reading of these sources can also contribute to studies that explore the ways in which religious ideologies confront one another and become reflected in the literary and historiographic works of the period, as well as the ways in which differing traditions envision not only the city of Jerusalem, but topographic space. Contextualizing this lament within a medieval Mediterranean framework also exposes moments of interpenetration and mutual exchange. This laments conceptualization of Jerusalem as a space which also includes the Armenians, as well as its symbolic representation of the world through a Teo structure, is reflective of a remapping of frontiers and the positioning of Armenians within the context of expanding European powers at the onset of a new crusade. At the same time, the poem is one that is mindful of the socio-political conditions of its own time, which it reframes and posits into the deep-rooted tradition of lamentation. As a medieval text, Krikor Dla's Lament, I argue, simultaneously functions as both an Armenian literary creation and a medieval Mediterranean one, in that the poem contributes to larger themes present in the Mediterranean, such as intellectual and literary transmission, military conquest, cons conceptions of sacred space, as well as the way in which medieval cultures perceive themselves and others, and how these viewpoints contribute to a greater understanding of both the opposing and intersecting character of the period. The world of digital humanities is another form in which these types of cultural interconnectivities can become more apparent. Uh, last year, I was involved in initiating a digital humanities project with a uh, computer scientist from UCLA, Dr. Ani Nahapetian, and professor of English at UCLA, uh, Matthew Fisher, entitled Comparative Text Classification and the Literary Geography of Otherness. The, this project sets out to explore the process by which literary texts register the growth of the interconnected cultural worlds of medieval Europe and the medieval Middle East by using software-based classification analysis. Our corpus of material, which luckily for us is all out of copyright, <laughs> is currently being drawn from uh, a number of sources, and I, I've, li I've listed them here. Um, through text extraction and classification analysis, we are mapping references made in these European and medieval texts to individual figures, ethno-religious groups, and places over time. And if I can just take a few moments and show you a little bit about how we're trying to um, so this is this is our project here and it's a really early stage it's a it's a in really prototype form but oh excuse me. I lose it I think I lost it sorry um, oh there we go and what you can do, or what we're trying to do, is see how texts and references to, we're really interested in references to uh, people, places, and, and groups of people. Um, and so as you go over time, you can see, and we want to see if there's an elevated kind of uh, textual reference to a particular city, let's say, do we see more, for example, after, we would expect to see more after the First Crusade, right? Or or material produced after the First Crusade. Um, but we want to map over time how many times, for example, a particular reference to an individual or a place appears in texts. And we're considering texts from a variety of sources, both Eastern and Western. And uh, the computer science element is wonderful because as I'm learning more about the wonderful things that computer scientists can do, <laughs> they can really gain, uh, gather information quickly, <laughs> more quickly than us scholars that are kind of going through texts and trying to funnel through them. They can just basically feed something to a program and in seconds we get, we get the answers. So, and then if you kind of zoom into an area and this is Ascalon, then you, we will be providing the text within which the reference appears, so the context will appear there. And, and we are working on actually trying to find, uh, create like a comparative forum where you can see the, the various kind of different references. And, and then for example, here Cyprus. Um, and then kind of comparing that, and I, I'm told this map will be a more contemporary map of the period, <laughs> but um, something like London, for example. 
right? Which is now modern Latin, but, and then you can just click and then you have the different texts. This is Richard's journey where you have London mentioned 40 times and so on. So, and I'm happy to answer more questions about the project as well. just left with the end, so. <laughs> As we saw at the beginning in the words of Pope Urban II at Claremont, conceptualization of crusade through an understanding of the Militas Christi or the armed pilgrim um, versus an accursed and foreign race of the enemy has for so long dominated our understanding of the period. As I have attempted to demonstrate today through my analysis of crusading scholarship and their attitudes toward Armenian sources, broadening our scope in the way we approach the study of the Crusades through an incorporation of not only Armenian texts, but other Eastern sources, such as those in Greek, Syriac, Hebrew, Arabic, and other traditions, can avoid the uh, imposition of national ideologies and preferential approaches onto medieval texts, as well as enable us to examine both the connectivity and distinctiveness of the cultural products of the period. The goal is to move beyond merely a discussion of moments of contact and transmission to discussions of reciprocal and mutual influence and the multiple meanings and registers built into works of art, historiography, literature, and other mediums. Just as the lament of Krikordra can take us beyond the region of Armenian Cilicia to Jerusalem and the rest of the world, our approach to the period can be better informed by considering the literary and historiographic works of the period, both East and West, as ones that contribute to a larger understanding of the Middle Ages and the region of the Mediterranean, a zone of both conflict and contact, interconnection and differentiation, and a translator of traditions, but also a space which is itself translated. Thank you.